Without any further ado, it is now my pleasure to call Kelly Bruff to the stage. As President and CEO of the Metro Chamber of Commerce, Kelly is focused on putting more Coloradans to work in really great jobs. It's cl a clear call to action that's driven this CEO from higher education to City Hall to the Chamber. Kelly has worked to advance our state and find opportunities for improvement, whether it's been advocating for P through 20 education reform, implementing groundbreaking programs like 311 and pay for performance for the city of Denver, or consulting on dispute resolution for local governments. She's directed an internationally recognized leadership program, been the chief of staff for then Mayor John Hickenlooper, and was the first female director of human resources for the city and county of Denver. In a common theme, she was the first female on-call snowplow driver, so don't pass on the right, uh, at the Stapleton Airport, and the first female CEO of Denver Metro Chamber. Though born and raised in a small town in Montana, she's Colorado to the core. In fact, you're as likely to catch her testifying at the Capitol as you are to find her climbing mountain passes on her road bike. Kelly will moderate our remar remarkable keynote panel, Denver's Mayors from 1983 to the Present. They will discuss the topic, Growing Responsibly, a 50-year perspective. Please give Kelly a warm welcome. Thank you, Sam. Good morning. You're going to have to talk back. Good morning. Wow. Uh, it is an honor to be here um, and an event I wouldn't have missed whether I got the chance to sit up here or sit in the audience to see these mayors uh, talk about this critical issue. So thank you for including me in this opportunity. We're going to start off by first having Mayor Hancock do a warm welcome uh, to all of you. You all know Mayor Hancock well. He is the youngest of 10 kids. He grew up in Denver's northeast neighborhoods. He graduated, he's a Thunderbolt, a proud graduate of Manuel High School. Uh, and there's a couple more of you out there, that's right. Uh, he had a dream when he was young of becoming mayor. And he spent, uh, was actually an intern for Mayor Federico Pena. After college, he returned to Denver where he worked to empower communities and uplift underserved families and neighborhoods through the, his work at the National Civic League and Denver Housing Authority. In 2003, as you all know, the residents of Northeast Denver elected Hancock to represent them on the Denver City Council. And in 2011, he became the first councilman to be elected mayor of the city and county of Denver and has served as our mayor still today. Please welcome Mayor Hancock. Oh. <laughs> morning. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Give yourselves a round of applause. I am honored to be here. Now, every one of these summits, this is the third annual summit that we have uh, coordinated through the city and county of Denver. But I want you to know today that you broke our attendance record. Over 700 of you are in this room uh, registered. I was getting text messages and calls last night during the Monday night football game with people trying to get into this room. So congratulations to all of you for making it through here today. I gotta tell you, today you're gonna see something very special. I'm very excited. But first I wanna make sure that we thank Jerry Tiano in the Office of Sustainability, Sanrisa, Jamila, and the whole crew for coordinating this great event and for your tremendous work year round. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you to the entire team. Today is history. Um, this is the first time that the four uh, living mayors, three past, one present, have appeared on stage for a local audience together. And so I'm very honored that our, my three predecessors are joining us today to talk about critical issues in our city, our region, and particularly su uh, sustainability. And so I know that uh, uh, many of you came to see this, and I'm excited that we get to it as quickly as possible, but I'm excited they joined us today, because I think what you're going to see is that from mayor to mayor, we have handed off this baton around the issues of green and sustainability that works for Denver. 
Um, before I sit down, I want to congratulate um, all of Denver for the passage of the Green Roofs Initiative as well. Um, yes, all the proponents in the room who wrote that initiative. Thank you. Stand up and be acknowledged. Thank you for being here. Now, we may not agree on how we got there, but we did agree that our values are aligned with the Green Roofs Initiative, and I can tell you now that the city team is working hard to make sure that we implement it and that it's successful as we implement it. So we congratulate City of Denver, and we're gonna do everything we can to make sure it succeeds. Join me once again in thanking Kelly Bruff, who's here to moderate this great discussion. She's on her way to have her own talk show. <laughs> Let's get this party started. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor Hancock. Uh, I also committed to any mayors who have passed, who are deceased, that they could speak through me, <laughs> and I will share information if they have anything to add to today's conversation. Make sure you call them by name. Uh, yes, indeed. I will let you know which one is saying what. <laughs> now it's my honor to introduce uh, the Honorable Federico Pena. He is a senior advisor at the Colorado Impact Fund, a venture, funding investing, a venture fund investing in Colorado and having a positive community impact in the state. Previously, Secretary Pena was a managing director and senior advisor at Vestar Capital Partners, a leading private equity firm. Prior to joining Vestar, Secretary Pena served as the US Secretary of Energy and the US Secretary of Transportation. Before he served in the cabinet, Pena was president and CEO of Pena Investment Advisors and, as you all know, mayor of the city and county of Denver. Please welcome Secretary Pena. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. And now I'm going to introduce Mayor Wellington Webb. He served as Denver's first African-American mayor from 1991 to 2003. In his three terms as mayor, he focused on four major areas, parks and open space, public safety, economic development, and children. His major development projects included Denver International Airport, a new sports stadium, expansion of the Denver Art Museum, and a new African-American research library. Prior to his service as mayor, Webb served in the Colorado House of Representatives and as a regional director of the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, a Denver City Auditor, and a director of the Colorado Department of Regulatory Agencies. He remains a force in Denver today as president and founder of Webb Group International. Please welcome Mayor Webb to the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Webb. And then I am going to also introduce Governor Hickenlooper. He's going to be a little bit late, but I'll do his introduction so when he slips on stage, you know exactly who he is. Um, uh, so, as you all know, John Hickenlooper is our current governor. He's a former geologist and entrepreneur, my former boss. He was recently added author to his res resume with the publication of his memoir, The Opposite of Woe, My Life in Beer and Politics. When he was inaugurated governor of Colorado in 2011, he had run on a history of collaboration for community good. He became the first Denver mayor to be elected governor in 140 years. He also became the first geologist to become governor in the history of our nation and the first brewer since San Sam Adams in 1792. He has recruited talent from all quarters and is redefining the relationship between a state government and its business and civic communities. So when he comes on stage, we'll give him a warm welcome then. Sound good? Yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you all ready to talk to these guys? I know I am. Uh, this is a powerhouse panel and a critical issue for our state, frankly, our country, uh, but we get to talk about it in terms of Denver today and how important it is, the work that uh, you're all doing and your insights and I thought an interesting way to start would be you all ran on a vision of the city you were trying to create and you communicated that vision to voters and they picked you to execute on it mm -hmm. and I thought maybe we start with you Secretary Pena of what was the vision you articulated and how are we doing today in achieving it? Big question. <laughs> First of all let me say it's an absolute delight and honor to be here with our current mayor, former mayor and upcoming Governor Bayer, who will be showing up uh, sh uh, shortly, but m mostly to be here with all of you, and I want to thank all of you very much for the commitment you made last year, 
the commitment you'll make this year to continue to move this city forward. So give yourselves a round of applause and, and thank you for your involvement. This is the kind of energy that we need. But Kelly, to answer your question, so back in 1983, anybody? <laughs> few hands go up. Few. Very few hands went up. Uh, we'll recall that I ran on a campaign theme of imagine a great city. And the idea was to ask people to elevate their vision. To not just think of having a good city or a workable city or a okay city, but a great city. And back then I sensed that there were a lot of people, just like so many of you here in this room, who felt they hadn't had an opportunity to be involved mm -hmm. in helping shape their city and to move their city. And so I felt that energy and that frustration and we gathered people together and that was a campaign theme. Now, the bad news is that shortly after I was elected, I don't know if there's a causal connection here or not, we went into a recession. <laughs> It was the worst recession in the history of the city. The entire Rocky Mountain region, for those of you who were not here at that time, went into a calamitous recession. Our unemployment rate was 2% above the national average. We had record foreclosures, mm -hmm. record bankruptcies. In one year during the 1980s, more people left the state of Colorado than came into the state. We had a net loss of population. Our air pollution was the worst in the country. We were tied with Los Angeles. And so we went to work. And the idea was to make strategic investments in a lot of economic development projects, which these mayors and, and John Hickenlooper did and added to, to diversify the economy, to rebuild the economy, to create jobs, and to dig ourselves out of this recession. But at the same time, Kelly, we tried to say, we can grow the economy by also respecting the environment. We can do both. Sometimes I hear people say, well, you can't support growth because you're going to hurt the environment. Not so. So we tried to do both. We had a terrible air pollution problem. We reduced those air pollution days down to zero when I left office from 100 and something. And eight years later, I think we got it down to one or zero. And so we can talk about that. But there was a way in which we could do that together. And the last point I want to make, because I know we want to hear from the other mayors, is that we were very committed to planning. Planning, planning, planning. Why? Because we knew that the boom would come back. These mayors know that. The economy would come back stronger than ever. But we needed to have plans in place to make sure that that growth was sustainable, and balance. And so we had a downtown area plan. We had a Central Platte Valley plan. We had a Cherry Creek plan. We had neighborhood plans in all the neighborhoods. We had a lower downtown historic district plan. We had a plan for building the baseball stadium in lower downtown because we wanted neighborhood activists, environmentalists, labor unions, business, and minority groups in every community in Denver to be part of this planning process to make sure that when the boom came, in the 90s and the 2000s and today, that we would have at least some sense of balance in that growth. So that's a short summary of what we tried, tried to do. And thanks to the work of these extraordinary mayors and many other people, we have the great city that we have today. So yeah. thank you to all of you. Such a, Good stuff. Yeah. Such a powerful <clears throat> vision to tell a community. Welcome, Governor Hickenlooper. <laughs> Good to see you. We were just talking about you. <laughs> so, yeah. Good to see you, sir. Uh, we've already talked about you, so we got it out of the way uh, and, and told a lot of stories, and now we're just moving on to the real work of the panel. So your timing is perfect. So, so and I would just say whatever they said, take with a grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> Except for, for Mayor Hancock, because he's in office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to say that when I, when I was running, I talked about how Federico Pena really got the entire city to what it would imagine a great city, and then Wellington Webb really built a great city, and my goal was to try and be a great city, and I think what Michael Hancock doing is becoming a great international city. Well, there's the summary. You can all go home. You <laughs> can all go. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what we were having a conversation about. 
Uh, Secretary Pena talked about imagine a great city. Mayor Webb, let's talk about what the vision was you put out and how do you think we're doing today? Well, Kelly, first of all, let me say it's a pleasure to be here and see so many of you here. And I'm glad after I read the invitation, you said you were going to have all mayors. And I'm glad you added all living mayors present <laughs> uh, so that uh, I would know exactly who was going to be here. I, I think that uh, when Mayor Pena was elected, it, Mayor Pena was a transformational, transformational mayor in terms of changing the vision of which way the city was going from the past to the present. And the slogan at the time, Kelly, as you remember, there are some people running on the platform of not building the airport, which would have put 10,000 people out of work. Can you imagine if we hadn't have gone forward? And so our slogan was internally, uh, let's build a great city. To the outside, we said he knows the way based on the view that we wanted to sell to the public the idea that between the three of us running, I was the best candidate to finish the job of building the airport, which we did 85% uh, of that. And then we also added a program to assure that locally owned businesses, women and minority owned businesses would have opportunity at the airport. With the opening of the airport, it also did one other thing, it opened up. 4,700 acres of new space to be built at Stapleton, and another 2,700 acres of space at Laurie Air Force Base, which had just been decommissioned. So for the first time in Denver history, we had three opportunities for build, to build at DIA, to build at Stapleton, and to build at Laurie. And I think that one of the things that Denver can be proud of is that as you look at the four of us, Unlike other cities around the country, you see a continuum of leadership that has been very similar, not always the same in style, but similar in terms of getting the accomplishments done to make sure that Denver stands out as a city second to none around the country. But let me close on this, and so Michael's heard this because he's also Baptist. Uh, we tend to close more than once. Uh, <laughs> One of the things I was always asked the question after I was elected mayor is, what do you want Denver to be like? You want Denver to be like Chicago or New York or San Francisco or Santa Fe? And I said, I don't want Denver to be like any of those cities. I want other people to wish their cities were like Denver. I want them to come to Denver. I want them to be like Denver. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I didn't know it was going to take on the explosion that it has. I, I, I contacted uh, Senator Peter Groff because one of my favorite songs was John Denver in his song, Rocky Mountain High. Uh, with the ballot initiative that passed on cannabis, that has brought a new meaning to Rocky Mountain High here in Colorado. I didn't know so many people would be moving in here for that. But for the, all the other activities that uh, I was proud of that we were able to be a part of. In the last point, Denver Health, we had to spin off a third of our budget public hospital, we spun it into an authority, and it's nigh in the black and doing well. Mayor Webb, I can't even imagine what our region would be if Denver International Airport right. was uh, not accomplished. Uh, and there is not a soul out there who believes that wasn't the most critical transformational uh, investment. And the, you have on the stage the two mayors who made sure we're where we at, and that was where we're at today, and fundamental. Uh, mayor Hicken, or Governor Hickenlooper. Oh, I put him back as mayor. Mayor, I'm happy to be called mayor in this group. <laughs> very happy. Governor Hickenlooper, you ran on change, as I recall. There was a great commercial about it. Um, talk about your vision and how are we doing today as a city in achieving the vision you had when you ran for mayor? And I, well, just, we, what we tried to do was, was change the way the way government's attitude was towards business, uh, especially small business, uh, mainly because I was running against four of the most talented lifetime public servants, and I wouldn't have stood a chance if I'd gone and said, well, I just want to make sure that what the great city that, that uh, Secretary Pena helped us imagine and, and this amazing airport that uh, Mayor Webb has pretty much built, uh, you know, we're going to finish that. It just wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been any fun. Um, <laughs> And also, I think there was a, a vacuum. I think you need different changes of emphasis. That's why term limits are probably a good thing. I think all of us have our pros and cons on it. But we wanted to bring, make uh, 
you know, Denver uh, pro-business. And, and we wanted to, to make it the center for, for entrepreneurs that just the way, and, and I think it's what's so great about what Mayor Webb said, and I don't think anybody, I've tried to be as good a predecessor to Mayor Hancock mm -hmm. as Mayor Webb was to me, and I don't think I've been close. He was so, so good. Um, and so it gave me so much time, more time than I could have ever asked. Uh, but now people come in all the time when I'm, when I'm traveling and people say, God, I wish, I wish our city could be like Denver. I hear it literally every trip I'm on. I was just in New Orleans. I heard it in New Orleans. I was just in Phoenix. I heard it in Phoenix. How do we get our city to be more like Denver? And to a large extent, it is this continuity of leadership uh, that, you know, we did a lot of what they built was quality of life infrastructure, and that quality of life infrastructure allowed us to, to really sell the, you know, I mean, we've got a thousand miles of bike trails in metropolitan Denver. We've got more live music venues now than Nashville or Austin. Uh, we really, you know, one part of it, which they did kind of unconsciously, we did it a little more consciously, was to make investments of, of public money that would be attractive to young people. Almost every other city, is, it's the people making the decisions are generally, well, older white guys who are making investments that they think would be good. You're outnumbered up here, you know that. Right? I know. <laughs> and, and, and the fact is, what, what everyone up here has done is we've made investments that young people would find appealing and attractive and exciting. And, and that's part of what's made us this magnet. And the challenge, I'll leave it with this, the challenge is now we, we did imagine and create and become a great city, but now we've almost at full circle. It's worth going back to when Governor Lamb rejected, led the, led the movement to reject the Olympics in 1972. And that, that rejection of growth, which is essentially what it was, it took all of these mayors, all of these years, to get that momentum going to where it is again now. And I think that the real challenge for Mayor Hancock, and I think he's doing exactly the right things, building infrastructure, the metro region has got to step up with the infrastructure, the state's got to be a strong partner, but we've got to be able to accommodate the changes that, that, that are coming from this growth. Our, uh, affordable housing is going to be a, continue to be, be a big issue. The only places that don't have problems with affordable housing are the places where they're not growing, right, where right. they're shrinking. Right. They don't, they've got plenty of affordable housing, right. but just because it's a good, it's a it's a bad consequence of a good thing, doesn't mean we don't have to address it. Yeah. Thanks. Good yeah. Very good. I love, uh, Governor Hickenlooper, the point about economic development is not just about the companies, it's about the workforce. The people. And making yeah. sure you're creating both a place and the opportunities where the workforce can take advantage. Uh, critical work to the success that we want to have. Okay, so Mayor Hancock, you ran on a vision. Um, how are you doing? How are we executing on it today? Well, actually, as Federico was speaking, I, I, I was thinking, amen, because that's basically the same environment that I walked into. The difference is we were coming out of the recession, um, the greatest economic recession since the Great Depression. And the city of Denver was at almost double-digit unemployment. We hadn't hired police officers or firefighters in five years. We weren't fixing roads. Uh, <coughs> Bear Hickenlooper um, did exactly what he needed to do. I was sitting there on the city council. Uh, while he was managing the city through that difficult recessionary period. We were one of the first cities into recession, first ones and one of the hardest hit by the foreclosure crises in the city of Denver, I mean the nation. And he managed the city to the bone, almost to the marrow. I came in the office and the first message that <laughs> Mayor Vidal, who was our, our mayor, uh, who was between Hicken, mayor, Governor Hickenlooper and me, said to me, he says, we had to cut $170 million from the budget. Now, I'm on council, so I knew he was working on this. He said, I did some of it for you. I cut 70 million. You have to go work on 100 million. You got to do it in 45 days to get a budget before city council. While we were planning the campaign, what we knew was this recession was so great and so deep that it was not going to be one mayor, one city council that was going to lift this city up, that it was going to have to be all the people of Denver who said we're going to have to make sacrifices and tough decisions to lift the city up and move it forward. And that's where we came with the slogan, we are all Denver. Every one of us has to believe that we love this city enough that we're going to make tough decisions, we're going to make sacrifices, lift this city up and move it forward. And that began to resonate with people. Yeah, you do mean me. 
that yes, Five Points matters, Park Hill matters, Cherry Creek matters, uh, you know, Baker matters, uh, you know, Vale matter, Hell matters. Every one of our neighborhoods matter. People need to lift up and, and move the city forward. And we came in, and I got to tell you, not only did we begin to make tough decisions with regards to the budget, in my first year, we asked basically the people of Denver to increase their taxes, to de Bruce the city, let the city keep um, the revenue that we were collecting. I had 12 people sitting around that table, my senior team. Only one other senior member agreed with me that I should ask the people to debrief the city in our first year, first term. The people of Denver resoundingly said yes, 73%. And we started immediately investing in small business, repaving our roads, hiring police officers, and people began to believe that we were gonna make a difference. We said we're gonna focus on saving the National Western Stock Show. It began to change. And the one key decision that we made was Federico said, let's build the airport. Wellington built it. Um, Hickenlooper really began to make sure that the airport was competitive. What we didn't do was to leverage the airport as an international powerhouse. Largest airport in the United States. At that time, the fifth busiest in the, in the uh, country and one, the 11th busiest in the world. As a non-coastal city, that was huge. And so there we go, let's make the global connections. And I'm telling you, that nonstop flight to Tokyo and all the others that we've received, about seven since I've been in office, have been real great magnets. Now, I will say this in closing. The growth, the development took off much faster and more robust than we ever imagined, which tells you that before the recession, while Hickenlooper, Governor Hickenlooper was in office, Denver was primed to take off because it takes that long. The recession stopped all that, at least paused it. And the key decision that Governor Hickenlooper made, then Mayor Hickenlooper made, was to issue $554 million in bonds and to build during the recession. That kept construction companies here, architects working. At one time, we were the only entity in the state of Colorado building anything, the city of Denver. That sustained us during the recession. And what happened was, when we were the leading city in terms of construction jobs and employment at the end of the recession, when developers and business people started moving, all of a sudden our economy took off. And all of a sudden people had to come move because the jobs were here. And that's what we're seeing, kind of the evolution of our growth, our development, and kind of the market being so uh, robust today. We are still one of the leading economies in the nation today. It is so... Uh when you hear this kind of continuum of story, it makes me think of two things. Uh, the amount of courage that you have to have when you run for office, uh, because unfortunately the decisions aren't all easy and apparently not everybody always agrees with you after they elect you. Um, but it also strikes me how, long, how much you build on the history of what people have done before you. And I wanna share with you an example because this is probably the sexiest example of a development in the country. Um, and certainly in our region, and it's Denver Union Station. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me, you know, Mayor Pena, you did the work to say we should consolidate these rail lines, we should uh, take down overpasses and put roads right through. Uh, and at the time, I think most people thought, yeah, Lodo can be cool and some brew guy will come in and, you know, build <laughs> something there. Um, but I don't think anyone probably envisioned maybe even what you and your team understood possible. And then Mayor Webb, you came in and said, we should put a big park in here. And I think most of Denver said, why? Uh, right? Nobody thinking about a long-term vision of, you've got to put in a park before you build. Mm -hmm. And this is a much more sustainable way to create a community and the vision of, this will be a community and people will live here. And then uh, Governor Hickenlooper, when you were mayor, uh, the opportunity to create Denver Union Station Authority and actually find the funding and strategy during a recession to figure out how you pull off one of the greatest uh, investments in the country Absolutely. to actually result in business coming in and your team and you did it. And now you look at what Mayor Hancock, you are making sure is achieving beyond all expectations what could have happened. And it strikes me, but for decades of people thinking very long term mm -hmm. and sharing a vision did you all talk about it? Like, was there a moment where you all got together and said, hey, you know, what I envisioned here, and I really hope you execute on it? My guess is not. <laughs> right. So the question for the audience is, how does that happen in a city? Because this is the kind of thing that makes us so much more competitive 
than every other city in this country. Yeah. Is that kind of collective, long-term vision of who we should become? Well, let me, let me start because I'm on the tail end of these three. But I'm going to give you all a tip. If you want to really see Denver's ascension to greatness, study Denver's history from 1848-ish forward. And you will learn that this ascension started with tremendous risk, sacrifice, but every, at every turn, at every seminal moment, transportation was a critical impetus. So it was building the railroads to connect to the, the, the Continental Railroad. 1929, building Stapleton International Airport. 1995, building Denver International Airport. And you can see very clearly, and when I study, Kelly, you say, was it planned? Was if you study the baton, baton passing between mayors, you begin to understand what your ultimate responsibility is as you take over as mayor. You gave me a great blueprint to recover from the recession. We were moving. Union Station was a great impetus, transportation, um, a great airport, transportation, fast tracks. fast tracks, transportation. These are, and it's all built on sustainability being more mobile. But I just wanted to make that point that if you look at that long view, you can see very clearly Denver's ascension to, to greatness. And, and, I, and I agree with that history, and it's important to recall it because for those of you who are new to the city, you may not understand that history. But we also have to be very candid and say there were also moments of darkness. Yes. And I recall in the 1970s when we were sort of the no city, we were voting against a lot of things. I remember that when RTD was first created, Regional Transportation District, and there was some issues there with the board, and people put on the ballot to raise the sales tax to start building light rail, voters voted no <laughs> several times in a row. And I recall back in those days, people used to say, it's Chicago that's the can-do city, and the Den Denver is the cannot-do city. Mm. But through the hard work of a lot of visionaries here, all of you, people who believed that if we made strategic investments, if they were done honestly, without corruption, without graft, and in full display of the public, involving the public, we could do things. And once we rebuilt that confidence, we became the can-do city. And now almost everything we ask the people in the metropolitan area to support, the Scientific Cultures Facility District, right. the Sports Authority District, other districts that are now created, people are voting yes because they now believe. They be, sort of the culture has changed to say, let's <coughs> invest, we know what investment can bring. Let's continue that strategy. Let's do it with full transparency. And that's now part of the culture. This is now the can-do community. And I think that's a major transformation. I, I, I agree with that. I think that the commonality that runs among the gentlemen on this stage is the vision and willing to take ch chances on the vision. A friend of mine that's on city council, and I won't say the person's name, I said, the difference between most council people they think about today, most mayors think about the future, 20 years out, what it's gonna, what's the city going to be like. Um, for us, uh, two quick points. We put $10 million into Union Station so that the city financially would have a part of Union Station before it became an authority because I didn't think it was I, didn't, I, I thought it was important that the city and RTD do that together before the, before the, before the authority was created. The, the second piece is why the park was so important. Think about it for a minute. When you build the park, you also put in roads, you put in sewer, you put in infrastructure. So that I met with David Syrie in San Francisco and I said, you know, if I get reelected, we're going to build this park. If I don't get reelected, because some of you that may be old enough will remember, we had a little baggage system that United Airlines required. <laughs> they were sending luggage to Honolulu and Casper, uh, Colorado Springs, when you were only trying to get to Brighton or Fort Collins. Luggage was going everywhere. And I said, but if, we, if we're fortunate enough to get reelected, we're going to build this park system, and it would be from the street to the river. And then that allows from the street to Union Station the ability to develop it 
from an economic development sense because the infrastructure will be in there. And, and, and that's also these bond issues. They're passing, I believe, because people have faith in the future. Yeah. And if you have faith in the future, you're going to vote yes. If you don't have faith in it, you're going to vote no. Mm -hmm. So true. And I think all the, and it's, it's just so cool to be up here with you guys. That, you know, I remember sitting on the loading dock of what's now the Wincoop Brewing Company yeah, in, in the, the end of 1987, we just signed a lease. And our lease for the beautiful historic building ground floor was $1 per square foot per year. And I was sitting there on a Saturday afternoon with one of my partners and there were tumbleweeds blowing down Winecoop Street. And, and, you know, so we opened and, and, and we opened in, uh, in October of, of, of 88. And just for the record, Mayor Pena came down for the, our ribbon cutting because we were the first restaurant to open in like five years. And he told me, he came, he came 30, almost 40 minutes early, which for, in a mayor's schedule is unheard of. It just means it's a great gesture. I didn't appreciate it at the time. I like but, beer. He, well, he wanted, <laughs> he wanted to see the brewery, get the whole tour. He, to this day, I've never given a tour where people ask more intelligent questions. But he saw the future of that historic district and what that could be in conjunction with the valley and the, and the, and the station and, and talked about it. Uh, Tom Goujon, who worked for him, he, he, I mean, all these guys have surrounded themselves with amazingly talented people. And Tom Goujon talked about how, you know, the new convention center, the, having it in the downtown, again, a visionary, smart decision. Uh, the airport, making that, that leap and, con you know, getting it, getting the voters to support that. Huge, huge, somewhat risky investments. Uh, and Tom Goujon said, you know, the convention center, the airport, all great, but that historic district will be, uh, you know, something that no other city west of the Mississippi can imitate. No one else has that historic district. And, you know, part of that has been the continuity of, 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 of all that. And you, you look at how when, when, uh, when the, the, the valley started getting developed, at first Mayor Payne started, but really uh, Mayor Webb, kind of delivered on it. And I remember sitting in that brew pub going, it's always going to be freight. Yeah, I mean, it'll, be, it'll get developed, but it's going to be like 20 years. Don't ever tell anyone I said that. Um, but how fast, the, 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 the strategic decisions, like Mayor Webb saying, putting the infrastructure in, mm -hmm. laying the groundwork so that it became the private sector that took it on when we borrowed the $300 million to make sure Union Station wasn't going to be done half-assed. It was going to be, you know, it was going to be a, a real beacon and, and a center, a convening place for the entire investment in transit, that, that the whole region, again, I love to, to stress that we are the only metropolitan area in the history of this country where we got all 34 mayors in 2004 to unanimously support the largest transit initiative in the history of the country, right? Four-tenths of a cent sales tax increase. Everyone, all, every, Repub I mean, Two-thirds of those mayors were either Republicans or independents that leaned strongly Republican, and yet they all saw that common investment. And that, you know, that ability to, to, to make those investments, is, uh, as each of these mayors has said, is transforming. And wait, 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 wait. And the, the, it's not also, I want to make sure it's not just the business stuff, right? So those investments, keeping people working, mm -hmm. If you add up all the money that, that Denver Health has invested now through bonds and things like that, you're getting up close to a billion dollars. Last time I looked at it, it was 880 or 900 million dollars. Huge investments, but they go beyond just building something. They're building something that allows us to take care of our people. Denver Preschool Program, exactly. only, only to my knowledge, and maybe there's one other city. There are now three or four, but they follow Denver's model. Right, so we, we passed the sales tax to make sure that every single four-year-old yes. could get high quality early childhood education. Actually, Mayor Hancock got reauthorized and approved. Yeah. But Governor, listening to you talk reminds me of something that we need to say. Entrepreneurs. Yeah. So it was this guy, John Hickenlooper, who <laughs> had this vision of going into a fairly desolate part of the city, right? Lower downtown, it was still tumbleweeds. You and your partners said, right. we're going to invest. And we need to talk about the entrepreneurial spirit yep. of this community, which is extraordinary. And we could not be where we are today, sure, with, you know, government that is open and supportive and making investments, but partners with entrepreneurs who believe in their political leaders mm -hmm. and believe that they can partner with 
public investment, with private sector investment. So let's hear it for the entrepreneurs yeah. <laughs> who have believed in this city, who have made risky investments, who have taken chances, mortgaged their homes, all of that, because they are really part of this magic. And so, Governor, thank you for believing in the brew pub. You inspired others to come into Lower Downtown. Take and Mayor, now you've got the benefit of all these entrepreneurs who want to even do more. No, you're absolutely right. I think the, to the Secretary's point, yeah, round of applause. In, in the last six years, 3,700 small businesses have started in Denver, Colorado, or have come to Denver. And we may not know it yet, but we'll, 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 when you look at cities like Minneapolis who have double the number of Fortune 500 companies that we have, you have to ask yourself, how in the hell does Minneapolis have more? Who wants to live in Minneapolis, easy, right? Easy, easy, but, but, easy. I mean, <laughs> but, but I always ask that question, have you been in Minneapolis in January? You don't go to Minneapolis in January. But here's the point that Secretary Pena is making. There's an ecosystem here uh, in, in Minneapolis, and we had to duplicate that. And that was one of the things that coming in office I knew we had to focus on, and that's where I directed the Office of Economic Development. We have always chased the big, shiny four or 500 employer companies, and that's great. But if you don't build a deep bench with your small businesses, small, medium-sized businesses, now you're more susceptible to the volatility of the economy. And what we focused on was let's grow our small businesses. Let's create that, let's, let's nurture that entrepreneurial spirit in Denver. And as a result, we've seen 3,700 companies. Some of these companies, companies like SendGrid, that today you and I get all these spam emails from Macy's, JCPenney's, whatever, they're sending 80% of those emails from Denver, Colorado, across the world, in downtown Denver. I went and, and dressed all their employees. And I said, before I talk about what I want to say to you all, do me a favor, go, go take my name off your server right now. <laughs> but they're, they're originating from downtown Denver, Colorado today, and it's going throughout the world. So it, it, that spirit is going to create, we may not see it for another 10, 15 years, but we're going to see Fortune 500 companies. We're going to look back and go, that was the era yeah. where this happened. Kelly, Kelly, I think that the, each one of the mayors up here and, 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 and the governor, not only friendly, working in a collegial spirit, there's also a toughness in terms of being willing to stand up for your plan and your vision to make sure that you're going to carry it through, mm -hmm. uh, when in many cases there may be doubters. Mm -hmm. And you may be the only one that's saying, I know this is going to work. And sometimes it gets pretty lonely out there. <laughs> uh, one of the times I was thinking very fondly about Mayor Pena after he had left uh, <laughs> about the airport in United. Oh. <laughs> I couldn't get United to work with us because they said they didn't want the airport anyway, right? United's got 67% of the traffic. They don't want to build a new airport. And so the, the, so the president of United, Stephen Wolf, says, I don't have time to meet with you, maybe in a month or two. And I'm sitting out here. I got 10,000 people who are trying to keep working. So he was on the phone, and I said, uh, Stephen, I just had a quick question for you. As you know, Denver owns the gates to the airport. Yeah. I'd like to know, where are you going to park your aircraft next week? <laughs> and then there was a silence on the other end of the phone. He said, what do you mean, where you, am I going to park my aircraft? I said, I guess you're going to park in Colorado Springs and bus your passengers to Denver <laughs> since we own the gates. He said, you can't do that. I said, I'm too new to know what I can't do yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Wolf and I met that week and negotiated a contract <laughs> for United Airlines to be at Denver for the long term. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So we only have about five minutes. Um, and you can tell I'm not really needed up here at all. Uh, these guys could go on uh, all day, and we'd all just sit and listen. Uh, but you have, for decades, helped make sure and provided the leadership to build this great city we have today. But this audience is building for the future as well. And so I'd like each of you to say, what is the most important priority you think this audience needs to focus on to ensure that in 30 years, when the next round of mayors sits down, we can say we are still the envy of the world in terms of what we're building. What is the most critical things we have to do? Yeah, I think we recognize that it is a comprehensive approach. I'm looking at the audience today, and I see leadership of all the various departments in the city of Denver. And when we pursue this broader, comprehensive vision around sustainability, we recognize that it will take George Delaney and Public Works. It will take um, Murphy Robinson over here of General Services, Ashley Kilroy, Excise and Licensing, 
uh, Brad Buchanan of Community Plan Development. It's going to take all of us, you know, Bob uh, McDonald from, uh, excuse me, Public Health and Environment, and Environmental Services today, to make sure that we make the impact necessary to be more sustainable. And so we cannot talk about clean air if people don't have a decent, affordable home to live in. And we can't talk about decent, affordable housing if we don't have strong, uh, diverse mobility options for people. And so it has to be a comprehensive approach. And that's what's made Denver great, not just for today, but those who will follow us. And some people we may never meet, but we're planning for them. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, let me just build on that. Uh, think about quality of life. What does that mean? What you've talked about, uh, mobility, diversity, housing that's available for all, a great educational system. We haven't talked about that. Does city government have something to do with it? Yeah, absolutely. But think about quality of life so that 20 or 30 years from now, people will say, those folks back in 2017, 2018 really understood that we can have growth and have clean air. We can protect the environment and have diversity. We can protect our values. For example, 20 years from now, do we want to wake up and find out that only wealthy people can live in the city? Mm -hmm. Like San Francisco, for example. You can't live in it unless you're very wealthy. Right. Or do we want to continue to have economic and social and racial and ethnic diversity, which is you know, what I think is beautiful about Denver and the country. So think about quality of life and as you're busy doing what you're doing, step back and say, is this having an impact on other aspects of our quality of life that 20 years from now, you can look back and say, I was proud because I thought about that and made that impact. So that's one other thing. When you think I, I have two quick points. The first one, don't let anyone limit your aspirations and your vision of what you think can be accomplished. I think there's nothing more important than your belief system that you can get things done and you're not gonna let anyone lessen what those aspirations are. The second one, which is equally important, is for whatever job you have today, always think about this, this from the standpoint, are you providing the kind of service that you would want someone to provide for you because there may become a time when you're on the other side of the counter. And in some cases, sometimes we don't provide that best service because we're the ones that are in charge. Just remember, you may not always be in charge. And sometimes the same people that you see, my dad used to say to me when I was growing up, just remember, everybody you see going up, you'll see those same people coming down. <laughs> don't get in that position. Always treat people with courtesy. Um, and I, I can't resist, I'm going to tell one story about, about Wellington just for a second, but first I want, I mean, we wouldn't be having all these stories if we hadn't had a great Chamber of Commerce all this time. And the right. Chamber has also had great leaders and continues. Uh, former Chief of Staff for one of the mayors up here. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, Kelly, thank you for the Chamber, all their work in helping be a partner in all this. And then I want to point out quickly that these two gentlemen are no longer what my grandfather would call spring chickens. Uh, and yet, look how young they look. Po politics can age people supernaturally, right? And, and look at the national figures, and yet these guys were in the pressure cooker uh, at all different levels, and they both look like they're probably just about to turn 60. Uh, and I think that should, well, oh, that, I think it, it's a reflection of the quality of person. <laughs> Mayor Webb, when, when I came in, and, and I was all trying, I, I was changing, gonna, you know, I was help bring small business into it, all this stuff. And, and we got, we didn't, we hadn't had long-term leases for Frontier and United. We'd had contracts, but not long-term leases. So I, I came in and we had, we had the worst budget deficit up until, <laughs> until Mayor Hancock's. Uh, so anyway, Mayor Webb always had a great sense of timing and he would consistently uh, get, be out ahead of things. All these guys actually have amazing sense of timings. Anyway, uh, Mayor Webb had gotten rid of his Broncos tickets just as the Broncos were going into a dip which we now know, that we know they're coming back, so don't fret. <laughs> uh, but he'd, and he'd gotten two tickets on the court at the, at the, uh, uh, Nuggets. for the Nuggets, uh, just when the Nuggets had, had drafted Carmelo Anthony. And Cleveland was coming to town on December 6th, I remember this vividly, and, and LeBron James was gonna be playing Carmelo for the first time, because they both were freshmen yeah. in the NBA. So I called up, 
my, my mayor and said, do you mind if, if, if you do have someone to go with you as your guest? And of course, Mayor Webb being Mayor Webb said, well, I have to give me a week. I've got some people to call, which just to let me know that I was down the list a little bit. But then he called me back and we went to the game. And I, you know, I had a beer. We each had a beer. But as you can see, a beer doesn't affect him as much as it affects me. <laughs> and at one point, I kind of got excited, a little excitable. I said, well, you know, if you look at it, uh, it, I mean, really, look at what's going on. Uh, we've signed United and Frontier to multi-year leases. We've solved the worst budget deficit in the history of the city, and the Nuggets are 14 and 4. And, and, and Mayor Webb put his arm around me and said, he said, Mayor, that's great news, and why don't you just give me a call when you've won two Super Bowls and two <laughs> Stanley Cups? <laughs> anyway. That's good news. Yeah. More seriously, the, the, uh, the one push I would give to all of you is, is embrace innovation. This is going to change so fast. Uh, this whole notion of apprenticeships and how we've got to get to a skills-based system of educating kids. 70% of our kids aren't going to get a four-year degree, and yet we need them to be much more skilled than, than they are right now. And I mean in, in the thousands, hundreds of thousands. And that's not going to ha happen without the entire community, just like Mayor Hancock said, and, and, oh, and each of these guys. No one can do this without, without the community support. And as this innovation, as automation eliminates whole professions, I mean, so many things are going to change so rapidly. Uh, Mayor Hancock attracted Panasonic out, and they're creating a smart city out at, at Pena Station. We were out there yesterday together looking at the first autonomous shuttles. I mean, we got to be on the cutting edge of all that stuff yeah. and embrace it and be the ones that make it work. Uh, and I think with, I mean, my God, thank God we've got a mayor who really embraces that. <laughs> so true. So uh, I'm in the tough position of trying to figure out how to express uh, even my personal appreciation for decades of leadership but on behalf of an entire city to say to each of you, um, you know, my job every single day is to sell this region to workers, to companies, whether it's to retain workers here or attract them, retain companies or attract them, and you have given us the best tools in the country to sell. And it makes my job very easy. And so a sincere thanks. What you expressed here are the values of working together across all sectors, public, private, and nonprofit, long-term vision, and to respect those who came before you. What I think you've told me the most is each of you built confidence in government, which allowed your residents to put confidence in you and continue us moving forward. So please accept our appreciation for not just coming here today, but what you've done to build the great city. Thank you so much. Service source. <laughs>